The paper is based on a study we did for TD Economics. Uh, we had a supply and demand conference on Aboriginal labor in uh, <coughs> Toronto um, about a year ago. Don Drummond and I worked on that and some others. And uh, what I've done is I've taken a few different uh, variables that we looked at um, in this issue because I thought it would apply a little bit more. But the real issue that we're interested in is getting, up, uh, getting to identify some key policy issues uh, that we need to attack in Canada if we're going to increase Aboriginal uh, educational attainment. Uh, and if I get that far, if Krishna lets me, uh, take a look at a new way of, uh, of doing research maybe uh, that will uh, yield us, I think, a bit better... Um, better results. To get that though, I want to take a look at uh, some gross attainment, some trends in Aboriginal um, identity, uh, and I apologize if some of our um, uh, US colleagues, if, I, if there are any terms you don't understand about in terms of identity groups, and just wave a hand and we'll try and fit you, fit you in. Uh, we're going to uh, look at um, types of education, PSE, high school, less than high school, and indigenous, non-indigenous. So in a grid, there's a hundred different uh, tables and uh, figures that we could do. Um, thank God I'm not going to do uh, anywhere near that, maybe uh, 10 or something. Anyway, so let's, uh, uh, oh, uh, just a quick plug. If any of you are working on papers that you think would be uh, policy relevant, please consider the International Indigenous Policy Journal. We have 50,000 uh, verified readers a year. It's free. I don't charge you to publish. You have to get through the review process. Pretty brutal. But after you do that, uh, we'll have that published in six months after acceptance. OK. So good news. Since 1996, uh, out to 2011, we see a dramatic increase in what we call a new middle class, Aboriginal middle class. This is an educated, capable group that are itching to make cap capacity changes in their communities. They want to honor the past, but they also want to weld the new, and, uh, uh, new ideas and uh, build their communities. So 183,000 people since, uh, since 96 have come through uh, uh, PSE, as we can see. Uh, by the way, I'll pass a, a slide deck to all of you and a full paper with all the uh, basic information in it. So that's good news. However, what we have to realize is that despite the fact that we have gross numbers that look really interesting, really good, uh, we have to remember that this takes place in the context of, uh, uh, of colonial past stretches back to the 1680s uh, that's been a train wreck in our country. And we have to understand when we look at any data about educational attainment or any other kind of social data, human capital, physical capital, or social capital, what we're looking at is the result of, uh, of an incredible history. I just threw a montage up. But I mean, essentially, kids were forcefully removed from their parents. It's important that we understand that. Thrown in the 30s, thrown into trucks, taken to live at school away from their grandparents and parents. What the Canadian state did during this period was to break down parental children relationships, grandparent children relationships, the teaching and learning that oral cultures have. And so what we saw was a real serious problem in terms of the development of social capital. And the worst uh, or best example of this policy was the residential schools. This not so brilliant plan uh, by McDonald that uh, was started basically full force in about 1876. This plan was to take the Indian out of the child. That was the slogan. Supposedly, it was going to be um, by boarding them and forcing them to lose their language and cultures and other uh, connections to their community, it was going to be able to help. Well, needless to say, it didn't. And it broke down and created what we call in sociology intergenerational trauma, which is measurable uh, through uh, uh, secondary variables, but not primary variables. Okay. So the fact that we have 183,000 people going through post-secondary education, given the kind of history that this country has gone through is truly amazing and it's very, very good. 
However, while we have a lot to be positive about, what we have to do is to really understand what, uh, that there is another story. And we can see from these projections that I've done that there'll be about 280,000 people with uh, less than high school if all stays the same, controlling for population growth trends in, uh, in non-completion. We can see that less than high school and high school are on upward trajectory in terms of, in terms of numbers. Let's, we can look at this also as percentage of population, which is an interesting way of looking at it. Um, from 1996 to 2006, there was a drop in high school only and a drop in less than high school. That's good news. The bad news, however, is that uh, the total, we see a leveling of these trends uh, over time, particularly 2006 to 2011. Now, one of the caveats methodologically we have to think about is this household um, uh, household survey that we had that replaced our long-form census, which you're quite aware of. We don't know till we get a couple more of these uh, NHSs uh, how accurate what the what the potential problems might be. So it buries. Looking at total population, though, buries another set of stories. And the first set of stories that is that uh, we have groups, uh, identity groups, that are having a worse time, Inuit status and on reserve, and we have some groups that are uh, achieving much better, Métis, non-status and off reserve. Secondly, regions in Canada have different kinds of uh, uh, educational attainment trends. So let's take a look really quickly. In terms of geographic trends, what I've done is I've just ranked it from the most successful attainment regions to the least successful attainment regions. This is not, uh, by the way, I just want to make clear, we're not saying that there's something wrong with the populations in these regions. These are trends we see that we have to understand from a policy point of view. So what's interesting here is at the bottom end of the attainment uh, uh, area, Nunavut, Northwest Territories, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, there's something very interestingly unique about these areas, right? They have very high uh, proportions or percentages of indigenous peoples. None of it's 87, Northwest Territory 60, my home province of Saskatchewan, although I'm at Western University, which is in the center of this. Anyways, let's not go there. Um, Saskatchewan and Manitoba are nearly 20%. So with high Aboriginal population areas and more problems of educational attainment, these lead to uh, social, political, and other kinds of problems that are going to have uh, dramatic effects on these regions over time. So let's go. So back to these guys again. Uh, okay. What we see, though, is that uh, we have lower PSE uh, and higher, um, less than high school in the uh, regions that are having trouble. Now. Bad news. Everything tells us two kinds of stories, though. The good news is, if you can close your eyes to the bottom half, is that we see some successful areas. So where I'm going to go at the end of the talk is, where do we want to do some research? We want to start looking at where things work. If we're going to develop policy, we're going to develop policy based on what's working. And there's certain ways that we can do that. So uh, Nova Scotia, for example, uh, where they have self-governing educational authorities with the Mi'kmaq people, communities of the province. They've reported high school completion rates of 88%, 88% and in 2012-13, which is comparable to non-Aboriginal <laughs> completion rates. So we can see in some regions uh, some, very, uh, some pretty good successes. BC, interesting enough, uh, hometown issue, it's right in the center, but it's the best of all the Western uh, provinces, a very high proportion as well as of uh, Aboriginal people. This province has 130 First Nations uh, community schools engaging in, in defining uh, uh, new curriculums. My daughter's a teacher in school. She has to put Aboriginal content into each of her course curriculums for her grade six, sevens, and eights. This is a very positive move, which we'll talk about if we get a chance. Okay. All right. 
Okay. So let's move from geography to intra-Aboriginal differences. In Canada, quite a complicated thing. Identity is quite... Uh, Métis, for those of people who don't know, are people of mixed heritage, uh, settlers and uh, uh, First Nations usually. Non-status or non-recognized by the government, but claiming Aboriginal uh, identity. Off-reserve are people living off the reserve. Uh, on reserve are people living on reserve or in First Nations communities. The First Nations variable is bizarre, I would ignore it. It's a mishmash of all people claiming uh, non-status and status Indians, but it gives you an idea of the impact of that. And Inuit are peoples who live largely Nunavut, Northern Northwest Territories and part of Quebec and um, the Yukon. So what we can see, though, is that there's some really interesting differences and important differences. The Inuit, we see a fairly large decline in the last uh, five years in terms of their um, uh, PSC attainment and also for uh, on reserve. And the First Nations won as well as no, uh, uh, um, uh, status Indians. If we look at the Métis and non-status and uh, on uh, on reserve, uh, off reserve I should say, what we see is a fairly uh, decent increase but we see a leveling of that trend. So there's two problems here. One is we have target groups, identity groups that have, uh, uh, are trending down, seriously down and, and have never really done that well and we've got some identity groups where have, that have made some progress that are uh, leveling out. The Métis, just to give you an idea, uh, they went up from 30% to 50%, right, uh, in, from 96 to 2011. Okay. There we go. All right. Now, we have to look at the gap. Any good labor market economist will tell you it's not only what you've got, it's what the other guy has. And so any gap between uh, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal populations is going to relatively advantage or disadvantage uh, different groups when it comes to uh, labor force attainment and other things. So it's what we see. Okay, so what we're looking at here is less than high school, high school, and post-secondary education. And if we look at the trends uh, moving up, the rate of improvement slows for the indigenous population and declines slightly and the improvement for non-aboriginal populations tends to increase over time. We've seen a real explosion. If we decompose some of this data, we start to see where that is and that's by type of education. So, if we look at PSE first, we can see that the gap for, um, we did an analysis of the gap for trades, college, and university, and this one's combined. Total Aboriginal identity, which blends the low and high achievers and geographic diversity. The gap has widened from 15% to about 20%. So we see even when we uh, don't look at it by identity group that there's a widening gap at the um, PSE level. If we look at the different types of PSE, first of all, apprenticeships and trades, there's virtually no gap. This could be, but, uh, but I should caution you, this could be explained, I'm going to make it, this could be explained, he's already looking at me with a smile, this could be explained by the fact that there's very few apprenticeships out there for anybody, right? We know this is a terrible market right now, but largely that's not the source of the problem. If we look at college, college system's not doing too badly, actually, in terms of the percentage of indigenous population versus the percentage of non-indigenous populations, we can see that the gap has actually stayed fairly stable. Uh, and it's roughly, it varies, but the, the gap between the two stayed uh, relatively the same. So where's the problem? Well, obviously, university attainment. We've seen that we're just not doing a good job at the university. Either it's we're not retaining people, we're not recruiting people. Um, it's on one of those two terrains. Every university's, uh, well, most universities 
are doing, uh, spending a lot of time doing the analysis. Western is indigenizing. Other universities are working really hard on it. I don't know about your universities in particular. But uh, this is a really troubling uh, trend. Partly this is explained by the huge interest in non-Aboriginal populations in getting degrees. Uh, and that just hasn't tracked. What we would say, though, is when we dig into the data just to get a little bit quicker to the bottom line is the key element or key variable that's going wrong is high school completion. The lack of high school completion or high rates of non-completion of high school is killing, um, killing the uh, uh, PSC development or post-secondary education development. This really follows along the same lines as Mike Mendelssohn's work, uh, which he was quite useful at. We're okay here? Okay. Okay. If we look at the different identity groups, what's happening in post-secondary education? Well, obviously, we have a real serious issue with uh, the Inuit following be falling behind. Métis are doing fairly well in terms, and um, First Nations, which is that blended category again, um, is uh, is declining. If we look at on reserve. Uh, you have to trust me, it's, it's not very good. Okay, policy implications. I'm just going to run through uh, a few of them, but first of all, we have to look at educational attainment or human capital development, depending how you want to look at it, as uh, it has to be understood in the colonial, um, within the colonial context. We've inherited a situation in Canada that, as we say, was really uh, um, a train wreck in terms of colonial policy. Policy needs to be developed in Canada that takes intra-Aboriginal identity into account, uh, which means we need special measures for certain groups, and we're going to have to do some major investments, particularly uh, in community or what we call sometimes on-reserve populations and Inuit populations. Um, we need to target certain levels of education to do more work. Particularly, uh, we need to uh, look at high school completion and public school um, preparation for high school. And the fourth is that policy needs to be developed based on seeing improving Indigenous educational attainment as an investment, not a cost. Currently, when we talk to government, um, uh, I know we will be watching, some of our government friends will be watching. Often the whole dialogue is around, we've already invested so much money and we're not getting a good return. And the problem is that uh, these are not costs, these are investments, and the cost-benefit analysis period has to be lengthened. So you can't expect a, a, a benefit analysis to be done after one year, or five, maybe ten, probably 20. And that kind of new way of projecting the, uh, the benefits has to, be, uh, has to be developed. Resources need to be moved in at an increasing rate. We're in the middle of an election. I'm certainly not going to talk about what parties are deciding to spend what money. But I would look carefully to see who's willing to do the investment. Any investment that we do now is going to pay back in social terms uh, over the long term because we face some very serious problems if we don't. And the last point is that we need to develop policy uh, in conjunction with First Nations themselves. Our consultation processes are very, very, very uh, superficial. And uh, the Education Act that fell apart in the last period uh, that cost uh, Sean Atlio, which I don't mind saying is a friend of mine and I respect it a great deal, uh, cost him his job. Um, really shows the kind of problems we have in terms of uh, consultation process. And it's not only talking to people saying, you've got 20 minutes at a mic, it's really developing those partnerships where you work together. Miriam isn't here, but I think the Native Nations Institute uh, down Arizona way, uh, are, they offer some really good models. I hope that the APRC that I'm with, Aboriginal Policy Research Consortium, does the same thing. So we need to uh, revamp our approach. Now that's easily said, but it's not so easily done. And so one of the things in an earlier slide I said, let's look at some of the data from the point of view of saying, what's, where are the success stories? Let's not just look at trends 
in general, but let's pick out the success stories, try and understand why they're successful, and then popularize them. But how do we do that? We don't do that just by looking at data that we can uh, get through our, our, our RDCs. Those are uh, data centers for those of you in the United States. Uh, this is important work that we do, and I'm not belittling it. I've spent a lot of time crunching behind the iron gate. But the point is we have to work with the communities themselves. And uh, we, for example, run a um, something called the Indigenous Health and Wellbeing Initiative. We do a training program for researchers, postdocs and graduate students and uh, junior professors uh, where they learn how to do community-based research and build partnerships. But if I could just, uh, this is way too much. Some of you be uh, aware of the well-being, uh, Community Wellbeing Index, right? Um, Maxim and I developed something called the Community uh, Capacity Index in year 2000. Um, out of a bunch of uh, really hard work that other people did after that, the C CWB. Now, all you need to know is that we measured well-being in uh, all the communities in uh, First Nations communities, 537 in Canada out of 640, Inuit communities about 50 and about 3,900 um, Canadian non-Aboriginal communities. Green is First Nations, yellow is uh, Inuit, and orange is other Canadians. Government looked at it and went, oh no, oh this is horrible because all the First Nations communities are generally at the poorer end uh, lower well-being. But actually, I looked at it and I said, no, no, no. There's something really interesting here, right? We have First Nations communities right up here. We have Inuit communities here. Let's identify them. So part of a new research approach is to identify those communities that are working and go and find out why. And I could tell you anecdotal stories about this. I was sitting in a hockey rink once. I, was, had, I liked hockey rinks because they're quiet. And I'm thinking, why is this community doing so well? And I'm sitting in a hockey rink, the same as I sat in the hockey rink in the other community, the same as I sat in a hockey rink in the other community. I got three whole minutes. You work for him? What? Two minutes. That is harsh. It's OK. I'm actually going to make it. I promised. We, I won't tell any more sociological stories. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, anyways, we analyze those communities, we develop partnerships with those communities. Another way of looking at that is to break down the issues that have something to do with what we're trying to accomplish, whether it's well-being. So create, looking at social determinants of well-being, for example, economic development, educational uh, attainment, health uh, improvement and delivery. We can identify where in the country these different uh, variables are measuring positively and develop those policies, it's okay, develop, uh, develop an idea with those people how they're doing that and then use the Aboriginal organizations, national and local, to be able to popularize them. So a new way to look at policy, a new way to develop policy. Thank you. Time left? Questions? No. <laughs> Thanks very much. So I'm done.